Change is the only constant. Heraclitus came up with that more than 2,500 years ago. But why does it feel more relevant than ever in our world today? Is it because one day we woke up to realize self-driving cars have stepped out of science fiction movies and onto our roads? Or is it because TikTok took over your world so fast that you didn't even try and catch up? Consumer trends are changing by the day. Marketing trends are changing by the hour. And content trends are changing by the minute. The only thing that remains constant in this perpetual state of flux? Humans. You, me, we, us. Humans. And the good thing about being human is, you can't really change all that often. So the only way to stay ahead of the curve is to focus on the human in the room. Not impressions, not clicks, not purchases, but people. In our second episode of Just Between You and Me, I sit down with Mark Schaefer, world-renowned speaker and author of The Marketing Rebellion, and show you how to stay ahead of the curve and win the war of attention by becoming the most human company in the world. That's Wednesday, May 13th at 10 a.m. Pacific on nvidio.io slash you and me. And a great big hello to everybody and welcome to our second episode, episode number two of Just Between You and Me. As I said, I'm Steve Dotto and I'm going to be thrilled to welcome in just a few minutes Mark Schaefer to join us. But a little bit of housekeeping before we get going. Uh, first of all, i got to welcome you all and thank you all so much for spending time with us today. Now, you're watching us in one of several different live stream feeds. This is being fed to Facebook and it's being fed to YouTube, but we're also sending this feed through to a special page which has been created in NVIDIA at nvidio.io slash you and me. Now, if you join us at that page, regardless of where you happen to be watching now, but if you move over and join us there, you can join in the large group chat that we're having, which is consolidated all in one space. So I'm going to encourage you to jump over to nvidio.io slash you and me, or you can certainly stay wherever you are, but we might miss some of your comments in chat if you are just commenting on YouTube or just commenting on Facebook. So fair warning, just to help increase the engagement. Now as well, if you are watching on any of these platforms, sharing this out to your friends, letting them know and helping us uh, reach out to a larger community if you think this content is valuable, is helpful to us. We appreciate all the additional sharing. So that's it. We're going to, now it's time for us to dive in. I am super excited because I just could listen to this guy talk all day. So just to, coming up, Mark Schaefer. Mark Schaefer, how the heck are you doing this fine day? Man, sir? I'm so impressed by your graphics. I'm just easily impressed perhaps, but man, you, you do, you're the best man. You're the best with, well, I video. would love to take credit for it, Mark. Uh, yeah. But you know who really in video our our host for this pot, pot, yeah. or for this live stream, uh, that's their stock in trade. They create all those little tutorial yeah. videos and all those promotional videos. They have the engine that fantastic. creates all of those. But I'm glad that you like it because yeah, I'm fantastic. I'm super impressed with them. <laughs> I just would have taken credit myself. That's kind of how I roll. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll take credit for some other things. <laughs> Yeah. Today before we are How done. are you? It's good to see you. I am great, but I have to ask you right off the top. How are you doing? Because you're like, how many times have you had this virus now? Just once. <laughs> <laughs> it might seem like forever. But you, uh, so you were, you were one of the only people I know that has actually been the, the, the contracted the COVID virus. No, you had, you had a period of a, what, two, two weeks, uh, 20 days where you were pretty sick. Yeah. Well, yeah, my wife got sick first. She was sick for, you know, almost three weeks. And uh, miraculously, I didn't get sick until she got better. So you know, that was just, you know, amazing. Um, you know, if you got to be sick, at least, you know, don't be yeah. sick at the same time as your wife. Yeah, no kidding. And then, uh, you know, for me, it, it lasted about, um, you know, about 30 days. And then, you um, Actually, I got retested and it tested positive again. So it ended up being about 40 days, but I, I wasn't sick that long. Oh, okay. So yeah. when, you, when I saw that you got that, you like you were going, what the hell is going on? I'm still Yeah, scared. it was really You're disappointing. Yeah. It was more of a mental block, you know, mental hit than anything because I was feeling pretty good by then. But I'd say, you know, I was pretty sick for about three weeks. Hits everybody, you know, hits everybody differently. But if you got any, if there's anybody out there thinking, oh, it's the same as the flu. I will testify it is not because actually I had the flu in February. 
so I can compare the two. <laughs> <laughs> this is worse. This is worse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you, you shared it with us all through social as you were going on and you had, I think you got a lot of love and a lot of support from the community, but it was good for us to also hear from somebody going through it. It helped open our eyes to just how serious, how serious it is. If it, you know, when it does indeed land in your home. Um, so, but we're glad that you guys are all on it. Now I got a qu kind of a sensitive question or I, I, I kind of feel guilty about this, but as a marketing professional, doesn't some aspects of the, pandemic excite you oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know it's well you look you know um <clears throat> i'm a marketing geek and my my mind's always turning and you know if if you love business and you love marketing there there can really be no more fascinating time that that, that we're in right now because you know all the you know, all the rules are being broken. There is no playbook. There is no path. We don't know what's going to happen next. And so it's just absolutely fascinating for me to, number one, watch how all this is rolling out from a business perspective. And number two, you know, what I'm kind of known for is thinking about what's next. And that's hard right now. So it's a really challenging time. And by the way, I don't want to I certainly don't want to come across as flippant because I, yeah. I recognize that, you know, we're in a very difficult time and many people watching in today are, are suffering and they're experiencing loss. And so I just want to acknowledge that, you know, I, I want to make sure that people know where my heart is. And, and, and that is certainly with, you know, with everyone who's going through loss and grieving and suffering right now. But you know, from an intellectual standpoint, it yeah. certainly is a fascinating time, Steve. Well, reacting to change is what you, and to a certain extent, I was made for. We were we were designed our, in our DNA is to help people understand and embrace change and mm -hmm. and react to it. Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So 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 when it happens this rapidly and there is this many unknowns, it's, it's just invigorating from a perspective, from an intellectual perspective. And it is it, in it, it. We, I do have the same concern of being seen as insensitive by being excited about the conversation, but that's what we have to be. We have to be engaged because we have to, we have to create some forward momentum. So pre pandemic, where was your headspace? What were you thinking about that? What was going to be your next big venture? What were you going to be communicating to the world? And has that changed with the result of the pandemic? Oh. That's a great question. Um, gosh, uh, let me talk about sort of like three, three layers. You know, number one, you know, I constantly evolve. I grow as a person. I grow as a professional. And I had a lot of content planned out for my blog and my podcast. And then really like early March, it's like, you know, put on the brakes. So that was the first thing is that I realized a lot of the content I had was going to be irrelevant. And so I had to, and honestly, Steve, for a period of about three days, I, I felt, you know, really sort of disoriented and lost because you could just see this wave coming at us. And it took me a few days to realize that, hey, in my heart, what I do through my blog, through my podcast, through my speeches, through my books, through my classes, is I'm a teacher. And so I had to like reorient and think, okay, I'm still the teacher, but right now I need to teach something different. So, so I had to sort of like pivot and, and, and reconnect with my audience in a different way. Now, the two big things I was working on is number one, and this, you know, this, um, I hope I don't get emotional about this because actually, you know, the, 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 the best thing I have ever done in my career is I created this marketing leadership retreat called The Uprising. And The Uprising actually was supposed to begin today. Oh. So here I am with you instead of, you know, these 30 marketing leaders from around the world who were supposed to be in Knoxville today at a mountain lodge, you know, thinking deep thoughts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, gosh, it was just, a, just, just so emotional and difficult that that thing had to be canceled. And, you know, people were just so looking forward to it. And, um, and you know, even this week, people are just sort of grieving that they're not here. So, um, you know, it's been rescheduled. Well, I've got another one scheduled. It had already been scheduled for October, but, you know, we'll have to see how that plays out. 
So, you know, that's, it's, it's a, it's a big part of who I am. It's an important, like sort of next step in what I'm doing. And it's become a good, an important part of my, of my financial plan as well. So boom, that was gone. The, the third level is I was starting to work on a new book and, um, the pandemic hit and then, you know, my wife got sick and I got sick. So there was a period there of about seven weeks when we had the virus, you know, in our house where literally I was sort of like asleep in a way. Um, you know, one of the things I haven't talked a lot about is for the three weeks I was really sick, I couldn't really think. Uh, I was having, I couldn't read, I couldn't write. And I was suffering from hypoxia. I wasn't getting enough oxygen to my brain. And it wasn't bad enough for me to be hospitalized. But I, I mean, this is going to sound weird because, you know, I love to think and I love to produce. The only thing I could do for about three weeks is lay in bed and watch sitcoms. That was the extent of my mental capacity. So just in the last week, Steve, I'm, or maybe two weeks, I've been like waking up to say, okay, what's going on? You know, where's the world? Where do I need to be? Um, you know, where conference is going to be this book that I'm working on? Is it still relevant? Uh, you know, I need, to, I need to reconsider because something like a conference or a book, it, it's so much work, so much commitment and energy that I've got to be right. You know, yeah. I've got to commit to the right thing. And so I need to take a little time to just sort of assess and and think about I'm, I'm behind the rest of the world because <laughs> you lost that three weeks. Because I lost that three weeks and three uh, weeks of stupid Mark. Yeah, <laughs> Zomb zombie Mark. Oh my goodness, how the other half lives. So, if I was your client right now mm -hmm. and I came to you and I said I'm concerned about what's happening with the change, who who do you think's at risk of being left behind? If you, if you're looking at at say a, a piece of content, by the way, what was what was the book about? Will you share that? Well, um, it, the, the book that I'm thinking about, and it's, it still may happen, is it's, it's based on sort of an obscure but important piece of psychological research that I think has big implications for marketing. And so it sort of explains why the rich get richer. So if you think about my book, Known, you know, yeah. one, it, it's about building your personal <laughs> brand. And by the way, you know, for everyone you know, listening in today, this is a great time to be working on your personal brand because, you know, there's going to be a shakeout, right? The, the competition is going to heat up. Some people aren't going to make it. Some people are, are going to be looking for new jobs. And if you're known, you know, if people have heard of you for something, then you're going to have a, a sustainable competitive advantage over other people. But there's Plus this you have a captive audience right now. Yeah, right. So there's this principle <laughs> called cumulative advantage. And what it shows, it kind of proves known in an extreme way. Known is the book that I wrote about personal branding. So it kind of shows like the rich get richer. So, and it has really, I think, profound implications for, for, for marketing. Mm. And, and you probably have seen this and experienced this too, where you see people who are at the top of our field. Sometimes they're, they're saying things that not, aren't even that smart. And people are like retreating it, retweeting it, going, hallelujah, this is amazing. And you're going, what? <laughs> and, and, and so what the book would be about is to kind of show why that happens, why it's hard to break through. And then what I'm, what I'm going to think through is how do you kind of cheat the system? Yeah, kind of blueprint. To kind of get around some of these things. I think, because, I think, I think Smart Mark should still do that book. Yeah, yeah, maybe we'll see. I'd be interested in. So, who of the of the when we look out in the industry, when we look out at different brands, yeah, who, who is at risk of being left behind as we as we do our next shift as we start to come out of the pandemic? Well, you know, so that's a it's, it's an interesting question, and it's it's a, such an important question, and so I think we need to we need to consider this as as an evolution in three steps. The crisis will come, will, will, will dissipate in three steps. So right now, we're in the teeth of the crisis. People are still locked in many places. 
you know, we're having meat shortages in some places. And so if you think about that old thing we learned in psychology 101, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? At the bottom of that pyramid, people can't think about, you know, expensive purchases until they have food, safety, safe air to breathe, shelter. Uh, a shelter over their head. And then right above that is, I don't want to be alone. You know, I don't want to be isolated. Uh, I want to be connected. At the very top of the pyramid is, uh, you know, should I, buy, should I buy a sports car? Yeah. So it's aspirational. And, and, and it would be even like what I did. I'm a marketing consultant, right? In a period of three days, I lost almost all my customers because they were in crisis mode. Their supply chain was collapsed and they lost 50% of their customers. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, they love me and they need me, but they can't pay for me right now. And I understand that. So I was at the top of the pyramid. So number one, who's going to make it? Who's going to fall out? Number one, if you're serving the bottom of the pyramid, if you're supplying food and food delivery and anything that's, you know, a service, services that can be delivered to a home during the teeth of the crisis, you know, safety, medical, something that assures people, you know, makes them not lonely, then double down. You're going to be great, right? Double down on your marketing. If you're at the top of the pyramid and you're selling Maseratis, then you've got to think about right now, how do we become relevant at the bottom of the pyramid? Because mm -hmm. having a sale on a Maserati is going to sound tone deaf right now. You know, if I went out and said, hey, I'm a digital marketing consultant now, 25 percent off. It doesn't matter if you're irrelevant, you're irrelevant. So as I mentioned, when I shifted to my content, you know, my content, I shifted my content from the top of the pyramid to the bottom of the pyramid. Right. Still am. Just came out with a new ebook. I wanted to I was going to ask you pandemic about that. business playbook. Right. That's exactly what I did. Came out with a new speech that talks about a lot of these ideas going to the bottom of the pyramid, all right? So that's phase one. Phase two is that we've been in this situation for so long now that new habits are forming. Yeah. Some are gonna tra be, are gonna come back to normal and some aren't. So there's gonna be a phase where some businesses are gonna have to like wake up their customers and say, hey, remember, you can still go on a vacation. You know, you can still go on a plane. Woohoo! We're free. Because a lot of people are going to be kind of, you know, in this little coronavirus shaped mold that, you know, we, we just forget what it was like before. Yeah. So the third period is going to be this wake up period, right? Now, the fourth period is after the, after the thing. And it's just like 9-11. There were structural changes to our lives after 9-11. There are going to be structural changes going forward. Let me give you one small example. So uh, during this lock-in, my wife and I subscribed to this thing called HelloFresh. You get ingredients delivered to your door and a recipe, and you can cook these meals at home. And... So we get them a couple times a week, and we decided, Steve, that we like this. We're learning new recipes. We're learning how to cook in some different ways. So think about this. After this crisis, we're going to be buying food through a channel I didn't even know existed two months ago. All right? An entirely new food distribution channel. So that's a new competitor for grocery stores. We're mm -hmm. going to have a new relationship and with restaurants food and restaurants. Yeah. yeah, we're going to have a new relationship with food, among other things, coming through this thing. You know, our children, we're cooking three meals a day. You know, our, our little children at home are going to say, Mommy and Daddy, we used to cook things together. Can yeah. we do that again? Right? We're I mean, rediscovering that's that's going to be a new habit. We've so, rediscovered fresh bread here, and we're going. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> apparently the biggest the biggest trend in the biggest trend in, in North America right now is sourdough bread. Right? Yeah, yep. We got sourdough we, bread. We named our sourdough starter. Did you name yours? Do you have one? Don't have one. 
See, we've got that's a tradition as you name them. Ours, yeah. by the way, is Michael Bubbly. Ah! I would have expected nothing else other than something extremely insightful and witty from you. Indeed. Very proud. So of that's that. so this is a hallmark of this third phase is that we have to really think about based on, you know, not worst case or best case, but what's the probability that our customers are still going to be there, that they're still going to have money, that they're still going to be buying the same way. And we have to like create this new profile of our customer and then say, okay, wait a minute. Here's how we used to connect to the customer before. Is that still relevant? Is it fair to say that maybe the marketing currency for this period, for this season has shifted in many cases from revenue to relevance? Uh, yes, I think for I, I think that's a great insight, Steve, especially for those people at the top of the pyramid that in the short term, um, protecting our, our brand and looking at this as an opportunity to create a lasting emotional connection that leads to loyalty is going to be more important than short term sales. You know, we have a you know, real estate sales have crashed, right? Because nobody's going to open houses. And so, you know, home sales are, are way, way down. We have a real estate agent in our community who, who started a local group to make masks. She was, she, you know, she was way ahead of the curve. She was doing this weeks ago. Now, nobody's going to remember her for some house that she sold, but they're going to remember her for being a community leader and creating this Facebook group that now has 800 people making masks. So she moved to the bottom of the pyramid, not necessarily to create new sales, but long-term she probably will. But she will remain relevant in her community as a result, yeah. which gives her the opportunity then when things turn around to re-engage in business. Yeah, it's exactly as you said, you know, it's like, the, the currency right now, it may not necessarily be sales. It may be emotional equity in your in what you do in your brand. And we've seen a lot of that in some of the in some of the mass media advertising from the car companies as they're, you know, every all of the pandemic ads start to look the same, uh, you know, with the we're all in this together type theme. But but I can't really blame them for that. I think that they're doing the best job they can. I actually do blame them. I really oh, yeah. do. Yeah, I do. Well, you can. Because you're the author. I'm just a consumer. You know, and the, and the, and the, the reason that, I, that I'm disappointed is because, um, so if you look at, I mean, some companies really rolled up their sleeves and got into the community and helped. Uh, an example would be, um, you know, Papa John's. Papa okay. John's create, that's a, you know, a restaurant chain here in, North America uh, pizza chain. And what they did is, first of all, they created a no touch pizza. All right. So they deliver this with a seal that said, no one has touched this box or this pizza. Immediately, they're at the bottom of the pyramid, right? It's safety. Yeah. They're in our community feeding our medical workers, right? So they've rolled up their sleeve and they've, you know, they've, they've become relevant. Now they're a big company, but you see, as you said, many, many companies have just followed the same old script that they've always followed. They, they got some advertising agency that says, yes, we need to tell people that we've always been with them, blah, 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 blah. And, and, and the reaction is, oh my gosh, this, this, you know, this is so boring. I'm so tired of hearing all the same things from all these big companies. Will you please show me something? Show me what you're doing. Yeah. Give me a relief on my car payment this month. Give me a relief on something. You know, we're, we're in a financial crisis. Help us. We're suffering. And it's all lip service. It's not human. It's, yeah. it's legally approved ad speak. Yeah. And they, and they, this is the time they needed a really show their colors and they, and they didn't do it. A lot of them didn't do it. So I'm disappointed. So you're, I mean, I mean, is it fair to say that your marketing mantra is the subtitle of the marketing rebellion book that if you, if you kind of live by one credo, it's the most human company wins. Absolutely. 100%. So my, 
So the question I asked you before is who's going to be left behind? The people that are going to be left behind are the companies that don't get that moving ahead. 100%. 100%. They're lost. They really are. And what really encourages me, Steve, and inspires me is if you look at a lot of the young people today that are leading <laughs> startups and new companies, and they look at this stuff the way that we've, you know, we're advertising and marketing to people, spamming people robocalls, direct mail, interrupting people, intercepting people. And they're looking at this saying, why would you ever do that? Why would you treat people that like, like that? We don't treat our friends like that. And they are really showing us a new way to, to go forward. A lot of the uh, case studies in the Marketing Rebellion book, I, it didn't really dawn on me until, you know, after the book was done, but a lot of them are, being led by people under 30 years old or under 35 years old um, because they really get it. They're digital natives. It's part of their DNA. And a lot of older people are trying to hold on to the old ways. They're trying to hold on to their dashboards because they're afraid. Uh, and and I, I think we're seeing that with the car companies and the insurance companies and uh, that are just, you know, not doing anything different in this pandemic. It's like, you've other got to be kidding me. Other than platitudes. Just tell so I'm now, I know that one of the losses that you're grieving is the, is that you aren't teaching. You're a university prof. You like to, you love to teach. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share right now on the screen. The, I guess is, is it the first chapter of the marketing rebellion? Yes. That that's right. We talk about the three rebellions. Yeah. So I'm going to ask professor Mark. <laughs> Quickly walk us through the first three rebellions because I I'm not too sure, but we might be heading for a fourth. Well, uh, as I was doing research for the book and trying to figure out why consumers have sort of moved so far ahead of companies and their expectations, there's this. I mean, the research shows there's this chasm. I mean, companies think they're doing a good job with their marketing. And our customers are saying, you're doing a terrible job with your marketing. And you'd expect some change, but I mean, it's like 80% difference. Mm. And so as I, as I looked at this, it sort of dawned on me that there's this history that when, when companies abuse customers and, and take advantage of them with their marketing, the customers rebel. And more importantly, they always win. So we have to understand what's happening because they're going to win. So the first rebellion really occurred in the early days of marketing and advertising. And back then, advertising meant creating remarkable promises. But the problem was the promises became more and more remarkable until they were lies. So the consumers rebelled and they had to be legislated. And there were laws passed. And, you know, we created like the Federal Trade Commission to say, you know, you have to be honest. You can't mislead consumers. So the first rebellion, no more lies. Now, was that spawned by consumer backlash, by a more educated oh, consumer base? 100%. Because okay. consumer, I'll tell you what really kicked it off, is that there was a, there was a series of magazine articles in the 1920s by Collier's Magazine it was like investigative reporting and they showed all these things that were being claimed to be able to cure this or cure this. It could actually hurt you. It could actually kill you. And so it was that series of articles that led to uh, just uh, literally a, a rebellion. The consumers, that's the thing that started it off. Then the second rebellion came really at the dawn of the internet. And the one of the most significant things about the internet was that all this information that we had in our businesses and about our products and in our governments moved to the people. And, you know, in my early days of business and yours too, we made money on the stuff people didn't know. Oh yeah, and we made money on the secrets. That's how you sold cars. That's how real you estate. sold real oh. estate, oh, insurance, vacation plans. Right? 
And I was in the middle of that. I remember thinking, how will, will there even be businesses after this when consumers know more about your products than we do? So that was really the second rebellion, which was no more secrets. So first, no more lies. Second, no more secrets. Now, the third rebellion is the, is the loss of control. You know, um, when I was a little boy, the only soap my mother used on my precious little bum at bath time was ivory soap. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that's the ad she saw. That's the only way she knew what to trust is what was on advertising on TV. There was no internet. There's no social media. There's not you know, people in chat groups talking about different things. Well, today, this has been really a cataclysmic change. That today, two-thirds of our marketing is occurring without us. When I started out in business, it was 90-10. The companies were in charge. We controlled our messaging. We controlled our brand. If you wanted to learn about this product, it had to be through our PR or our you know trade show booth or our advertising. Today, the customers are carrying the, the message forward. A brand used to be what we told you it is. Today, a brand is what people are telling each other. The mm. customers are in control. They, the customers are the marketers. And, and so it's like this requires this entirely new mindset about what marketing needs to be. It's not about convincing people or manipulating people. It's about coming alongside people who have the accumulated knowledge of the human race in the palm of their hands, who are capable of making very good decisions, coming alongside them and saying, how can we help you today? How can we create something so interesting and fascinating you're willing to tell your friends about it? So they're being responsive rather than dictatorial. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So I love those three rebellions, but I have to wonder, is the change that's happening now enough of an impetus to foster a fourth rebellion? Is there going to be a fourth rebellion? Well, I, th I think what's happening now, this reflects the conversation we had a few minutes ago. I think what's happening now, it's accelerating the third rebellion. Okay. That's exactly what's happening now. Yeah. Because a lot of people have come to me and said, Mark, your book was prescient. You called the shots on this. Look what's happening. These companies are being forced to be real, to get down in the trenches and help people and show real faces, real heart, real passion, instead of these stupid scripted, uh, you know, TV commercials, they're all alike, right? The people are, there's, you know, those, the pandemic com TV commercials are starting to become a meme. Yeah. It's, it's becoming something that people are making fun of. All right. That's the entire premise of my book is those days are over. Those days are over and we don't have a choice. We have to understand what customers really want today, what they really appreciate today. And we have to get down and live where they live. And that's, you know, some, you know, scripted TV ad is not where people are living today. So every good revolution or rebellion has to have a cause celeb. It's got, it's got to have its, it's got to have its, its criteria. And you have, you have penned that. You've created the manifesto, your manifesto for human centered marketing, mm -hmm. which I love. I, I know that the our, our our hosts today they shared this with their entire company, oh, uh, thank all you. of their team to make sure that they understand. Thank you. How long did it take you to come up with this? And and is this completely related to the third rebellion? Yes, you know it's a funny story how I came up with this because when I was working on the marketing rebellion book. Uh, it really sort of has two halves. And the first half is talking about, you know, what's wrong, what's changing, how we sort of need to change. And then the second half is here are very specific tactical things we can be doing right now. Here are things that every single business can do. And so I was in the middle of this book. And, you know, as you know, you know, you've consumed a lot of my content. I am not a fluffy person. I'm not a fluffy writer. I don't have a lot of filler. 
you know, in my book, there's an idea on every page. There's an inspiration on every page. And by the time I got halfway through the book, I thought, man, I covered a lot of ground. This is really dense. I, I, I kind of need to summarize yeah. where we are before we go into the, you know, ways to make it happen. So that became the manifesto to say, all right, here are the 10 things that I've sort of covered so far. Let's remember where we are. Let's remember these mileposts. And now let's talk about how we get there. And the manifesto, by the way, there's I have a book page on my website, uh, Marketing Rebellion book page, and you can download a colorful version of this manifesto. It's free. Yes. It's free. It's hand drawn, hand colored by a, a local artist. And there are lots of there are lots of companies in America that have that pinned up in offices. Uh, it's it's been very very popular. Yeah, it's it, and and each one hits like a ton of bricks. You know, you, we we could do a show. You, I it, I wish that I was starting a podcast series on marketing, and I could just have my first ten episodes architected because they really they really do each one lands. But I got I got to ask you about let let's we don't have time to go through them all. Let's, but let's talk about number two briefly. Technology should be invisible to your customer and only used to help your company be more compassionate, receptive, fascinating, and useful. Well, I Put think that in perspective with bots today, because I think yeah. there's two sides of that coin. There are, there definitely, definitely. So, you know, I think when, when technology makes people angry, I think maybe there's kind of like an overarching idea in, is that, you know, so we have this human centered marketing manifesto. We have these 10 points and people say sometimes, well, you know, how do I get started? Here's the first thing you do. Go back to your company and think about what are we doing that people hate? Then stop it because you know if they hate it because you're a co consumer too. If you would hate it, don't inflict it on somebody else. And a lot of that, Steve, is because people are, are completely obsessed and preoccupied with technology and the MarTech stack, right? Right. And they've forgotten, they're lost, they're disconnected from what customers really want. So if you abuse technology or overuse technology, you're setting up a barrier between you and your customers. Successful marketing is using technology to take the barrier away. Look at what we're doing today. We're using this marvelous technology to show our faces and show our hearts and our smiles and, and the friendship that you and I have, right? The comfort that you and I have. We're sharing ideas. You can hear the passion in my voice, right? So this is very human. This is, we're using technology to completely take everything away and show these two people having, you know, this um, amazing conversation. So that's where, that's the beauty of this, all right? Now let's get the bots. You know, the research shows that a lot of times people prefer dealing with bots than real humans because bots can be more human than humans. And we're seeing that a lot of people are very accepting of bots. If you're kind of transparent and say, yeah. this isn't a real person, you know, this is a bot. If you need a real person, we'll help you. But generally speaking, people are accepting of bots. If it can help them save time, um, you know, it, it's not that hard of a calculation. You know, if your competitors suck and a bot gets you just one level above suck, you're winning. It's that easy, right? So, I mean, you don't have to be some, you know, amazing, you know, human person. You're being more human by just getting one step above terrible. And just, you just got to, you got to keep moving forward. You know, you got to keep moving forward. One thing that is there something to the fact that it's the the um, the impetus to create the technology. If you are looking at that at that technology to to defer your connection with a customer, to kind of mm -hmm. deal with them as the great unwashed and help them get through the stuff, but not really have to communicate and spend your cycles, yeah. as opposed to really trying to serve the customer's need, 
of getting to the answer they want and really serving that, but never creating, never making it a, the, the bot a gatekeeper to a real person. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's a lot of that, and I think there's a lot of it's just the same reason why people were obsessed with their Martech stack. That you know, in many companies, marketing has become a glorified IT department. It's being run by the IT department, and they're focused on how do we take out cost. How do we take out people? And they're they're not fo- it's they're really they're sick. It's it's a sickness in marketing right now. You know, marketing should be about all things human. And today, you know, it's very common to talk about marketing in terms of all things tech. Yeah, yeah, fair point. So this allows us to transition. Going to get a little lighter for a moment. You know, I'm a tools guy. Yeah. What tools are you, what do you use to get you through the day? What are the tools that are on your computer, on your phone that get you through the day? Oh, I am going to be such a disappointment to you. Yeah. It's in so many ways, Mark. In so many yeah, ways. Yeah. But, you know, I, so a lot of people ask me, you know, how, how do I get so much stuff done? Because I do a lot of different things. I seem to be going a hundred miles an hour all the yep. time. And, and the real key is, is to have discipline and to be focused on the things in my business that are revenue producing. And if it's not revenue producing, then I either say no or I outsource it or you know get rid of it. One of those things that is not revenue producing is trying new tech. You know, I just don't have time. So basically, you know, I let other people like you figure it out and then you know, whenever I'm running into a problem, I'll call up Steve Dotto and say, Hey, what do you use? And then I'll, I'll, I'll be a fast follower. Okay. Uh, you know, for me, you know, I think there, there are a few things that I'm seeing now uh, that I like. I mean, one of the things that has helped me is um, AI transcription. Oh, okay. yeah. And do it, you it, dictate, do you like dictating? No, but um, sometimes I'll need, a transcription of a video or a podcast. Yeah. Um, you know, the way my brain works is, you know, I'm kind of like a writer who likes to think about things and let things sit. But, you know, sometimes for a customer or for something I'm working on, I need a transcription. And so there's a there's a service that I've found to be excellent called Otter, like the like the animal, O T T E R Otter.ai. And um, you know, now I'm starting to explore some new technologies for, um, you know, online presentations. You know, um, I think some of the things that you're doing with video today, I think it's very, um, there's a good lesson here because to be, to, to make it through uh, the, you know, all the, the noise of our day and to be the signal, you've got to have a certain entertainment value, right? Yeah. People have certain expectations. People's expectations today is Game of Thrones. Yeah. That's how you break through the clutter. Game of Thrones. All right. Now we, you know, you can't be Game of Thrones, but you got to be a show. You know, you, you've got to have a certain entertainment value. You have to have a certain aesthetic to cut through the clutter. And by the way, that's the big obstacle right now with online meetings versus real meetings. You know, when you and I go to a real meeting, we'll we'll say, hey, hey Steve. Let's have breakfast. Our day starts at 7 a.m. And then we'll go to some sessions and then we'll talk in the hallway. And then, you know, we'll be out late and we'll be having drinks with friends at 11 o'clock at night. With an online meeting, there is just no way you can stay connected for more than an hour or two. Right. And so and 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 there's also some, you know, brain uh, uh, psychology reasons why people get tired, you know, early. So there's going to have to be some technological breakthroughs. I think that combine, you know, technology, entertainment integrated with speakers and new ways of speaking and new ways of interaction and engagement for, you know, for online to really replace offline. And I think it's going to happen. I think there's going to be breakthroughs in innovation in the next six months in this space. I'll be fascinated to see that. So let's 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 make it simpler though. And and there's no wrong answers. So what do you write in? What's what's your writing tool of choice? WordPress. 
So you write, you you write right within your WordPress. Generally, yeah. And if you're doing a book, Word, you just write in Word. Old okay. school, baby. I, that's cool. I because Word, Word, know. Word can do everything I need. And what about what about for your contact manager? Do you just keep your contacts in a calendar? How do you keep? How do you stay on top of your tasks and those to dos? Um, basically, Office Outlook Suite. You know, okay. off, yeah. The Microsoft Suite. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, those are the sorts of things I need to know. I just have to know because you might be using some ultra cool word processor that I've never heard of that just make makes my head. Well, there's, I mean, there's lots of things out there, but it's like you know, you, you, first of all, I mean, generally speaking, I mean, there's there's some quirky things about Microsoft, and and look, you know, you can use Google Docs, you can use all these different things, but. You know, Microsoft has put a hell of a lot of money and a, hot, a lot of resources behind that suite of products. It's not that expensive, and it works really well. Yeah. It integrates into a lot of things. And so, um, you know, like I said, I'm I'm not going to spend my time trying to find something new because the incremental value is so small to me right now. That's such a... Now, we're at a cusp when it comes to online presentations where now... For me to be success, successful as a teacher and as a speaker, you know, I need to understand what's going on with new presentation technology. Yeah. That's part of my core competency. That's part of my core revenue stream. So, not, yes, I am going to learn about that. I have to learn about that because that's core to my business. Yeah. The word, the, word processing is not. Presentations and what's going to happen with virtual summits. Mark, you, I mean, you, you as a looking at a tool like Zoom, you're going, oh, this is going to. Yeah change my opinion on it. I'll share it with you later. But it's yeah. just, it's a, there's, I, I believe that there's going to be a shift in that space. Yeah. Because, we're hyped. Okay. SEO. Down. We can't linger. Okay. Membership sites. Oh boy. You know, they're, they can be very important, but you've got to be known. You know, that's the, that's the mistake people are making right now. They're trying to create membership sites without working on their personal brand first. Yeah. Okay. Digital health. Oh, wow. <laughs> transforming, transforming. 24 seven support. Uh, table stakes. Oh, good. See, you are good at this. Privacy. Oh, privacy. Um, ren uh, renaissance. I think, you know, uh, people are taking it more seriously. Yes. Zoom. Mm. Savior. <laughs> right place at the right time. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm confused by the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I used, I used a, a bunch of different technologies, go to meeting, especially with all the, especially with all of the, Sometimes warranted, usually not warranted criticism and fear mongering that came yes. out against you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, it it. Has, and it doesn't matter. Which brings us up to trust. The only thing that matters in a brand. Yeah. Very, very. So excited to see what happens with bots. <laughs> Exciting. See, I'm down on them. I just, I just can't get. I can't get excited. I, I I'll, recognize tell you, you. I'll tell you why in a minute when we're down. I'll okay. get out. I'm going to open your eyes to an idea. I'm going to, I'm putting a check mark next. Jury's out. Okay. Fair enough. TikTok. It is the homeroom for a generation. Okay. Very good. And the final one, the gig economy. <laughs> Imperiled. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was good. I, I, I had fun with it. It wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be, was it? Oh, it wasn't. No, no. Cause they're good things. Bots make me feel better about bots, Mark Schaefer. All right, here here's a prediction that in the next six months you will see lists of the most fun and entertaining bots. So I don't want to be on a customer service call with Nike, but I would be on a customer service call with Nike if I was talking to a Michael Jordan bot. <laughs> so bots could be, so think about it. Bots could be a form of entertainment. And at the same time, you're engaging with your customer in long conversations, collecting information. 
So is the bot then going to become a meme? Are people going to be so caught up with the fun that they have with the bot that they're going to screen capture and we're going to start seeing posts of yes. conversations with bots the way we Absolutely. do on phone? Calls? I mean, you know, I mean, just think about if there was a if there was a, a Bruce Springsteen bot, I would geek over that. I mean, he yeah. would never do that, you know, or a Dolly Parton bot or, a, you know, a, you know, a Bruno Mars bot or whatever it is. I mean. There's an opportunity there for 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 like conversation marketing that we're overlooking. There's an opportunity for to you know have deep engaged conversations with our customers uh, that are going to transcend the transactional opportunity of bots right now. It's th there's a whole new entertainment value and branding value for bots that we haven't even you know started to scrape the surface of okay well uh, i'm ah, you heard it here first you heard i i, I did i did <laughs> and and i'll start working on we'll st you and i should lead the way we should do the steve dotto and the mark schaefer bot they'll be popular as heck you think i think so i think people probably would probably pay for a steve dotto bot that's it. I'd pay for that. It's if something to replace. That'd be awesome. Mark, the people got to read the books. The books are coming out again, or it's starting to become popular again because we had a dip in the last yeah. month, but now we're going to see it. We're seeing yeah. people starting to read again. Marketing Rebellion must read for anybody in the marketing space. Known is, is it just takes you into what all it, Mark says influencer marketing is just beginning. Known should be a Bible for them and soon to be released. Why the rich get richer. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Mark, it has been such a pleasure to chat with you today. I appreciate it. I'm glad that your health is good. And uh, I just kind of I wish you well and look forward to more content coming out from you in the not To be connected with you. Mark Schaefer, folks. Now, let me let, fill everybody in on what's coming up next week. Next week on The Big Show, we are going to be joined by, uh, let's, let me get the, the slide up. There it is. Next week, we're going to be joined by David Foster. David is one of the co-founders of Live Streaming Pro. We're going to be talking about what it takes to create great live streams from a technology basis, from a content basis. David goes and he builds out studios for some of the most popular and most effective and the most significant live streamers on the planet. And nobody knows more about the world of live streaming than does David. So make sure that you join us next week uh, with David Foster as we are going to be exploring the entire world of live streaming. And I'm going to put a wrap on things today. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, the replay will be available very shortly here on the channel. And we look forward to seeing you next time right here. I have to do a great big shout out and thanks to our benefactor, to the folks at NVIDIA. Mark mentioned right off the top of this show today how great the graphics are. All those graphics are created using NVIDIA's video engine. It is the tool that we use for creating all of our promotional content on my main channel at Dottotech, and it is well worth you having a look at yourself if you are not yet already in the camp. Till next week, I'm Steve Dotto. Have fun storming a castle. <laughs>